Enga mana enga reo, ro raketera ma, ten na koto, ten na koto, ten na tato katoa. Norera, ko waio, ko Harleen Hain, tako wa, ko te tumuaki o te wanaka o atako aho. Nami hi nui kia koto, norera, ten na koto, ten na koto, ten na tato katoa. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Harleen Hain, and I am very pleased to be here this evening to welcome you um, and to introduce our guest speaker for the University of Otago Chaplaincy and indeed an Abrahamic Interfaith Peace Lecture. Now, I'd like to begin by thanking Matt um, for his wonderful mihi fakato. Thank you very much, Matt, um, for your kind words and setting the cultural space in which we will work this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge a number of distinguished guests who are in the audience. Um, Dr. David Clark and Claire Curran, welcome um, to both of you. Um, Mayor Aaron Hawkins, who I understand did just slip in. Where is he? Where is he? Good on ya. Welcome, Mayor. Um, our Chancellor, Dr. Royden Somerville, um, Bishop Michael Dooley, and I would like to extend a very, very, very warm welcome to members of the Dunedin Abrahamic Interfaith Group and Otago Tertiary Chaplaincy. Now, it is my great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our very distinguished guest speaker this evening. Um, but before I do that, I think that a peace lecture is really an opportune time for each of us to just spend a few moments to count our own blessings. So as for me, not a day goes by that I do not reflect on the privilege and the blessing of my position as a professor and as the vice chancellor here at the University of Otago. I'm blessed to lead a university that is full of gifted researchers, award-winning teachers, and a highly skilled group of professional staff, including our chaplaincy team, who are going to be leading our discussion this evening. I'm also blessed to work in an environment, although not always peaceful, um, that is lively and extremely beautiful. I'm also blessed by the students who attend the University of Otago. Uh, these bright, incredibly articulate and ambitious young people come from all over New Zealand and the rest of the world to study with us. And because our students come here not only to learn, but also to live, they have ample opportunity while they are at Otago to meet others whose cultural practices or religious beliefs are very different from their own. The impact of these experiences stay with them for a lifetime, forever changing the way they think about things like religion, community, society, and peace. And finally, I am incredibly blessed because the university attracts some of the best and the brightest and the most interesting guest speakers to our campus, which brings me to why we are here this evening. On behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly welcome our guest speaker, the Right Honorable Helen Clark. Now, as you will all be aware, Helen Clark was the Prime Minister of New Zealand for three successive terms, from 1999 to 2008. She was the first woman to become Prime Minister following a general election, and the second woman to serve as Prime Minister. Throughout her 27-year tenure in government, she was a strong advocate for economic, social, environmental, and cultural development. She pushed hard for a comprehensive program on sustainability for New Zealand and for tackling the challenges of climate change. In 2009, Helen Clark became administrator of the United Nations Development Program. She was the first woman to lead the organization and served two terms there. At the same time, she was the chair of the United Nations Development Group, a committee consisting of all UN funds, programs, agencies, and departments working on development issues. She completed her tenure in that role in 2017. Helen continues to speak widely and to be a strong voice on sustainable development, climate action, gender equality, women's leadership, peace, and justice. I will end my introduction this evening with the words of John F. Kennedy. Peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process 
gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. Here at Otago, I think we are an important part of this process. May peace be with you all. Namihi nui kia koto no reira, ten na koto, ten na koto, ten atato katoa. Now the format for tonight is a little bit different from what we usually do at these lectures. It's going to be a conversation. And I now have the great privilege of handing over to Reverend Olivia Dawson, who is going to be our MC for this evening. Olivia. Tenakoto. My name is Olivia Dawson. I am one of the ecumenical chaplains and part of the Otago Tertiary Chaplaincy here at the university and at Polytech. On behalf of the entire Chaplaincy Fano and the Dunedin Abrahamic Interfaith Group, I welcome you to this very special occasion. Now the Dunedin Abrahamic Interfaith Group was formed in the aftermath of the events of September 11th in 2001 out of the expressions of desire for solidarity among local faith leaders. The group is made up of members of three faith traditions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And each are considered an Abrahamic faith as each tradition can be traced back to Abraham as an important faith leader. Since the group's beginning, along with the Otago Chaplaincy team, these peace events have been hosted annually, inviting a variety of local and international guests to share their views and personal experiences regarding the importance of faith and religion among the conversations around peace. Now, if you've attended any of our previous peace lectures, you may have begun to notice that tonight looks a little bit different than in previous years. Instead of a lecture, we will be having a conversation with the Right Honorable Helen Clark and our three panelists. And each of our panelists represent a particular faith group, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And it is our hope tonight to engage in conversation about the importance of peacemaking and peacekeeping, our roles as individuals, as a country, as a humanity. Now, a few important things to keep in mind before we officially begin. First of all, in case of an emergency, you will exit out the way you entered. Most likely you noticed where the toilets were when you came in, but if you didn't, they are clearly marked with signs and someone will be out there to point you in the right direction. And I remind you to please silence your mobile phones. Following this event, you are invited to All Saints Anglican Church just down the road for supper. You can follow the crowd, they'll show you the way. After the introductions and an opening question, we will pause for reflection, for prayer, and for a bit of conversation. If you are of the Muslim faith, you're welcome to leave for prayer. I know that many plan on praying out here on the mezzanine, so you can walk up these stairs out those doors at the top. And for those who will remain in here, we will have a pause for quiet reflection, and there will be a question for, dis for discussion to share among your neighbors. Now the individuals up here, while they do represent a particular faith group, they are not expected to speak on behalf of every member of their particular faith group. They are, of course, individuals with their own opinions and thoughts that have, them sh that have been shaped by their religion. So while you might subscribe to one of these religions, it's still possible that you won't agree with what these panelists might say. And that is okay. In fact, we celebrate the beautiful diversity that's found in and among every religion. There will be a time for question and answers at the end of the conversation this evening. You will be encouraged to ask a question for discussion among the panel and Helen. We ask that your questions be respectful and asked in a way that embraces the character of this event, which is one of unity centered around the collective focus of hope and peace. Now we've heard a bit about Helen in our Vice Chancellor's introduction a moment ago, but now I'd like to introduce to you our panel for this evening. 
we have Reverend Dr. Jordan Redding. I'll give a little wave. He is a Christian in the Presbyterian tradition. He is a part-time chaplain at the university and part-time minister at Knox Church in the center of town. He holds a PhD in theology, specializing in theology of being human and theology of care. Emily Schwartz, she is our Jewish panelist. She is a teacher and a rabbi in training. She holds a BA in Judaic Studies and International Affairs and recently er her earned her master's in Hebrew literature from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York. She moved here from the States almost two years ago to be with her partner, Matthew. She serves on the board of the Dunedin Jewish Congregation where she helps with religious services and learning opportunities for the Jewish community. And then we have Amal Abdabali. She is our Muslim panelist, and she calls herself a science girl with microbiology, biochemistry, genetics, and a science communication background. She currently works at the Social Impact Studio at the university, which is home to Unicrew, Silverline, and the Leadership Award. So thank you, panel members, for your time and your willingness to be here in the spotlight this evening recognizing the importance of these conversations. So now, I'm gonna come over here and join you all so that we can kick off with our opening questions. Does everyone make sure the microphone is on and working? So Helen, I look to you for our first question. Now we heard a bit of your impressive resume from Harlene just moments ago, but I wanted to highlight one um, part of your resume, really, that was kind of one of the focuses of interest of the Dunedin Abrahamic Interfaith Group and the chaplaincy, and that was the fact that you are the patron of the Religious Diversity Center. So can you share a bit with us of the vision behind this council and why you were motivated to get involved? I'm there, I think. <laughs> well, firstly, thank you, Vice Chancellor, for the welcome to the uh, university. I've been around the, the campus most of the day doing uh, various things, a very good program on Vote 2020 from the Politics Department. I recorded an interview for. Uh, great to see the Electoral Commission's youth outreach here with the enrolment signs and, and so on. The youth enrolment is, is creeping up, but could go uh, away yet. I've been part of a, a discussion about the issues in the cannabis referendum, and then in the course of the day, I've been meeting with uh, 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 those associated with the interfaith discussions uh, here on the, on the campus, so good to be here. Uh, on the Religious uh, Diversity Trust, uh, I was approached by, you know, obviously, very old contacts, uh, George and Jocelyn Armstrong, uh, who felt you know the, the call to do something like this in a structured way. I was still at the UN at the time, but they asked me if I would be patron, which I agreed. Um, I might seem an unusual person to ask to be a patron of such a trust because I, I don't myself have uh, religious beliefs. I'm a secular person. But it was very clear to me uh, over the many years I was in public life that our... Uh, society uh, was becoming increasingly diverse, and while that diversity is is often thought of in terms of ethnic or nationality diversity, of course, that with that comes uh, the faith diversity as well. And it, it seemed to me that uh, New Zealand needed to be uh, you know, tuned in to, to good initiatives which would get people talking uh, and respecting each other uh, across uh, faith boundaries. Uh, when I was PM, of course, the, in New York, the tragedy of 9-11 of happened, and that got a lot of people thinking about you know, the, the issues of, of conversations across faiths, across civilizations, across uh, nationalities. And at a relatively early stage in the 2000s, uh, we, as a government, uh, signed on to an Asia-Pacific uh, interfaith dialogue and uh, sponsored people from uh, different faiths to go up as part of a joint New Zealand delegation to meetings. And the high point of, of that process for me was when the Asia-Pacific interfaith dialogue came to Waitangi and, uh, and met there. There was another important uh, initiative too in those 
those years, that first decade of the century, and that was the Alliance of Civilizations Initiative, which was taken as an initiative through the UN uh, process, uh, led by Spain and Turkey, you know, uh, obviously a, a country with a, a major Catholic Christian tradition and, and a country with a major Islamic uh, tradition. And they really did a great job of, again, you know, finding ways of getting discussion across civilizations. And that, that initiative still, still exists and occasionally there's meetings, but our contribution to it was to, as a government, host the first uh, regional dialogue in the world uh, for the Alliance of Civilizations. So we had a marvelous workshop actually uh, with uh, people uh, coming from around the Asia Pacific region, but also uh, from Norway, where the uh, former Prime Minister, Mr. Bondovic, who was a Lutheran minister uh, by, by background and trade and, and very interested in dialogue, we invited him. Uh, we invited the Finnish Foreign Ministry, which was developing a strategy uh, to encourage uh, dialogue. So, you know, I had, I had these experiences as PM. So I, I saw supporting uh, George and Jocelyn with their initiative as a way of, you know, just continuing to encourage uh, New Zealand and New Zealanders to, you know, think think about who we are as a nation, the many different components of beliefs and the diversity that makes that up and respecting each other. Absolutely, thank you. And so thank you for being a part of a small scale version of that here with us this evening. Um, and to continue with our warm up question panel, I'm gonna start with you all and then we'll come back to Helen. But how would you, we wanna kinda of set the scene here, how would you describe the word peace? And why might it be a topic that should be discussed? Hello, everyone. Shalom. Um, the word for peace in Hebrew is shalom. And this sort of peace is something more than just an absence of conflict or an absence of violence. Um, shalom really means a, a kind of wholeness or completion. Um, and it is something that is of the utmost importance in Judaism. Um, even our Talmud says that the entire Torah, the entire Bible, is for the sake of shalom, is for the sake of peace. Um, almost every Jewish prayer we have, every, every major Jewish prayer, um, concludes with an appeal for peace. But when we speak about peace, um, my understanding and my, my background teaches that shalom is something that has to start from, from within. We say shalom balev, peace in the heart. And once you can achieve that kind of inner peace, we can uh, achieve a, a broader circle of peace, like shalom bebayit, uh, which is shalom in the house and with your family. And then that, that ripple effect goes out so that we have shalom in our community and, and among our neighbors. And then eventually, if enough of us are, are trying to obtain that sort of wholeness, that, that sort of um, like completion, then we can have shalom in the entire world. And I think it's worth talking about because it is I, really of the utmost importance for all of us to be able to communicate. Kia ora koutou. I asked Emily to go first um, because I believe a, a Christian understanding is deeply rooted in the Hebrew scriptures. And that concept of shalom is at the heart of a Christian understanding of peace. In fact, almost the last page of the Christian scriptures in the book of Revelation, we have a vision picked up from the prophet Ezekiel of a restored, renewed creation where all is living in right and flourishing relationship, right and flourishing relationship with the earth, the fenua beneath us, right and flourishing relationship with our neighbor, and not just tolerating our neighbor, but seeking flourishing life with our neighbor and flourishing life within ourselves as well. The reason I bring up that flourishing life for our earth and for our neighbor and for ourselves is that this isn't a utopian vision. This is a journey that we must go on together. And at the heart of the Christian scriptures, we have this image of God and Jesus Christ who walks the way of suffering, love and humility and so in a Christian understanding of peace, you cannot understand peace separately of justice and a coming to terms with a reckoning of abuse of power. 
So justice and peace go together, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Helen has to say about some of her experiences um, of conflict overseas, because it seems peace has to work towards that reckoning of justice, getting our hands dirty, and actually talking together, dialoguing about what peace looks like in ongoing relationship. Um, kia ora everyone, assalamu alaikum. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to meet to Matt um, for opening the space so beautifully for us to have a conversation like this. Um, I'd also like to Mihi to Uncle Mac and the Deneen Abrahamic group for having me on this panel. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, so my name is Amal Abdullahi. Other than being a science girl, I'm also a big family girl as well. So I have a really big family. I have six brothers and a sister. And the reason why I'm talking about my family is I suppose that is where my idea of peace came from. Um, so both of my parents um, are Muslim um, and they brought us, raised us up in the um, Islamic faith and they really carved my shaping of what um, peace is. So us Muslims, the way that we say hi and bye to each other is with the word salam and it has the same root as the word Islam which means peace. So to enter Islam is to enter peace and peace, how do you obtain it in Islam is to submit to the word of Allah and um, for me my submission aligns with my interpretation of Islam so every Muslim um, has a different interpretation of Islam but um, for me that's I submit to the word of God how I understand it and how it feels right in my heart um, but in the context of outside of my life peace I think peace is submitting to the code or the word of humanity and I think when you read the news or you kind of observe what's happening in the world we clearly are not on the same page about what this code of humanity is um, but it doesn't mean that it cannot exist. I think for this kind of peace to exist we need courageous leaders who will create spaces for all voices to be heard. We need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, we need to be having conversations like this. So it is really important to talk about peace. I think sometimes when we talk about it in our day-to-day -day life it comes across as really fluffy and like, ah, oh, hope and peace and naivety. But we all need to be a part of the conversation to kind of figure out what the heck this code of our word of humanity looks like. So so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Helen, would you like to share what your definition of peace would be? Well, I think life is very miserable without it. <laughs> That's my first point. Um, I became uh, very interested in issues of war and peace and uh, the lack of human rights um, and how that traumatizes societies when I was a student. And like, uh, I guess, looking around the room, quite a number of you, uh, I was a student in the 1960s and early 70s. And there were a number of movements. One of them was the movement against New Zealand's engagement in the Vietnam War, which I had, you know, had my cameo role in as a, as a student. <laughs> Uh, turning up to you know to ma various manifestations uh, uh, about that. Uh, then, of course, there was the huge issue of nuclear weapons, and the uh, you know 60s, 70s, 80s. They were pretty scary times uh, in in that whole issue area. You know, the election of Ronald Reagan and the rhetoric around that, the kind of dying days of the the Soviet empire, these were dangerous times. And uh, again, the, the peace movement in New Zealand uh, against nuclear weapons uh, was, was very, very strong. And uh, again, I you know, played a, a cameo role in that. Uh, the other one, of course, was the, um, the support that mobilized over time in New Zealand uh, for you know, the major human rights battle in South Africa to demolish apartheid. And South Africa could never be at peace while that ball and chain was around the ankle of the country. He heaven knows it, it faces many challenges still, but you know that just had to go. It was uh, uh, one of the most grotesque abuses of of human rights. So that that was my background, and then I guess uh, I came to you know, thinking about peace through that lens of how do you get peace uh, between nations? How do you try to persuade people that you know, defending yourself with nuclear weapons shields isn't any defense at all. 
Uh, it's, it's interesting to me, having spent the eight years at, at the UN, really how much nuclear disarmament had gone off the agenda, and I think that's worrying because this last four years we have seen systematically the nuclear arms architecture, which was preserving peace between Russia and the United States, being pulled apart. Uh, you know, treaties probably, you know, most of us here don't have in our everyday language, but, you know, the ones that govern the, sh the medium range nuclear missiles in Europe and so on, it's being picked apart and that should be a huge worry uh, to us all. But it, it didn't have a, a lot of prominence in those years. What I was seeing most in the, in the debates uh, at, at the UN about peace was this, this uh, sort of emerging kind of conflict which was highly intractable and which the UN mechanisms couldn't really deal with. And that was uh, the, the civil wars, that the disparate non-state actors, uh, the UN consigning, quote, peacekeeping missions to countries where there was no peace to keep, or hybrid missions as in the Mal's uh, uh, heritage country, uh, Somalia, where the African Union provide the troops and the UN the diplomatic cover, but there hasn't really been a peace to keep in the centre and the south. So, you know, you, you observed all these things, but, you know, there's a lot we can say about all of those issues. Come back to home, uh, yes, I think New Zealand's on a long-term search for internal peace as well. Uh, you know, we have had uh, running since the early 1970s what amounts to a, a long-running Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the form of the Waitangi uh, Tribunal and its important reports, and then moving to the the whole um, historical treaty negotiation um, uh, process. But it goes a lot deeper than that, doesn't it? Uh, I think we're reminded as we watch the agony play out in the United States of America, triggered by the outrageous uh, killing of, of George Floyd, that we ourselves have great inequities in our, our systems of law and order and who is impacted by them and the, the legacy of that going back to, uh, to colonial times. So we have a lot to process here. And I think what's important is we see this as a journey, you know, it, it, it is, and we, we have to find, find ways of, of, of dealing with that. Uh, then, so you have, you know, are we at peace as a society? Are we at peace in communities? Uh, are we at peace in our homes? And, you know, we live in a country where the home isn't a very safe place for a lot of women and children, and that should deeply concern us as a peace issue, in my opinion. You know, often people say, oh, hasn't New Zealand done well for women? You know, women prime ministers and the vote and being head of this, that and the other and 41% of the parliament, uh, whatever. And yet we had, I think, among the worst domestic and family violence rates in the OECD, which speaks to some deep violence somewhere in our, in our society. And so, yeah, it's, <laughs> once you start talking about peace and you're going for the family through to the, the, the global level, there's, there's just so many issues and enough work for all of us, whatever sphere that we're, we're working in, wherever we decide that we can make a contribution to uh, addressing one or other of the manifestations of the problem. Yes, absolutely. I think it's important to recognize that whether it's from a religious background or a secular view, peace is something we all agree that needs to be worked towards. And the fear of life or world without peace is too real not to be able to have these conversations. Um, so we will pause now, as I mentioned, to allow time for our Muslim brothers and sisters to pray. Um, for those who will remain in this room, you are invited to reflect on that same question. How might you define peace and why might it be an important thing for us to talk about? So we will spend some moments in silence um, as, our, as our brothers and sisters leave and they will trickle their way back in. Um, we might continue the conversation while they continue to come in, but let us pause now for a moment of silence. If you would like to engage in conversation with those around you around the question of how you might define peace and why you might think it's worthy of a discussion in this sort of atmosphere, you are invited to do so. Get the chat rolling. <laughs> 
Do you think, am I blocking that side no, of the room? No, no, I, I, you think it's, I, I saw you move back a little bit. Hmm. All right, we're just about to hit my bedtime, so we'll see what happens. What did you do earlier? Who knows what time I'm going to have to get up for tomorrow morning. How old are these? We have Mike who's eight, Lila who's five, and Nora is 11 months. So our mornings are still unpredictable. Oh, yeah. Our overnights are still a bit unpredictable. She wakes through the mornings. Well, she's okay. The five-year-old is still, you know, they all have something at some point. Well, not every night, but. I thought five-year-olds just did and stayed there. Yeah, no. Oh, I think it's helpful to have, because the youngest is still not hot. Oh, she can get out of here. Oh, oh, it's a so the and Does your husband yeah. uh, work or is he work time? He does. Yeah. He works part time um, in IT. Yeah, so he, uh, he does most of the school pickups, um, but he does work about 25 hours. But is the chef to see what is that for twenty plus Yes. Um, it's not common to receive it, it has to be it's a pretty critical incident to be called yeah. on the weekend. Yeah. Um, and, and that happens a few yeah. and that happens unfortunately a few times a year, but it's not yeah. too regular. And one of you will be on call for that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we had one of those. Maybe a couple months ago, that was the last one. There was a couple at the beginning of the year. So a handful. Which was the university where students probably used to skip out of the semester. It is. So nobody knows who was in the day. It's terrifying. It's just so horrendous. It's just. Yeah. It's just I'll bring us back, but then he'll start us off. <laughs> Do 
generally not. Um, we have, I mean, he just he just got his PhD from the theology department, so we have very, we do work closely with them. Um, but as of right now, neither of us teach in the theology department. I invite you to bring your attention back to the front. And no doubt we'll still have our brothers and sisters making their way back to their seats, but we will move forward with our conversation. Now our first set of questions come from our panel members directed to Helen, and I'm sure they will offer their thoughts behind the question they ask, but panelists, I turn it over to you. Well, I'd like to begin. So Helen, you mentioned um, earlier some of uh, our rather proud history as a nation in terms of um, standing up for peace and justice internationally. You mentioned uh, the Vietnam War, you mentioned South Africa, you mentioned um, our anti-nuclear stance and so on. That proud international uh, reputation is somewhat undermined, I think, by our rather complicated um, story within our own shores, that we are still a people that in many ways are not reconciled, and you mentioned that peace in our own land. So my first question, before we look overseas, let's begin here. How are we doing on that path of reconciliation, and how do we move towards peace constructively in this land of Aotearoa today? Well, as I said, it, it's a process, right? It's not one swing of the wheel. Uh, you know, a lot happened. Uh, people were here 
Indigenous people, other people came, displaced them. Uh, we live with the reality today that that displacement is then reflected in a lot of uh, you know, not, not nice statistics like the imprisonment rate, etc. cetera, uh, the unemployment levels, socioeconomic status. So, you know, we, we should never shy away from saying that we have major, major issues of, of justice to tackle at home. And they've got to be tackled through you know, every means, every means available. I think also that you know New Zealand has a, a somewhat patchy uh, history of absorbing uh, other nationalities as well. You know, one of the actions we took early on when I was PM was to offer an historic apology to the descendants of the early Chinese who faced a, a unique form of discrimination, several unique forms of discrimination, actually. I mean, no one else had to pass a, you know, an English uh, a language test. They couldn't bring their families. Uh, this led to loss of culture. I mean, one of the reasons for getting in behind the, the beautiful Shanghai-style Chinese garden in Dunedin was, again, you know, restoration of support for restoration of culture and and so on in, in, in that community. Uh, there were attempts to discriminate against early Indian migrants in the same way, but for some reason the British felt quite strongly about that and put their foot down, I think, in the, in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, there were commissions of inquiries into the Dalmatians who were thought by the majority of society to be also you know, somehow not nice. I mean, you, you could go on. It's not that great. So we, we have had, you know, quite a lot to overcome to at least, you know, come to the appearance of, of, of treating people equally. But you get a little bit shattered when you read today still the experience of, of a number of, of, of newer migrant communities and the problems they've felt in, in, in becoming accepted. In New Zealand society, so so it is a journey. Now you know that's kind of all on that level of um, inter-ethnic, uh, indigenous versus newcomers, differences between faiths, work to do. But then I think there's other elements of peace too. I mentioned the domestic violence, which I, I won't mention again. But you know we have a, a bullying culture. We have a significant problem of bullying in our schools. This needs uh, a lot of attention. Uh, social media has its good points, but one of the bad points is the bullying that, that it facilitates. You know, the an anonymous hate attacks, the trolling. I mean, you, of course, you see it in the political sphere. It's very unpleasant. But, you know, just shocking when it leads to, you know, young people being driven to consider suicide because they're being bullied through the Instagram account or or Facebook or, or whatever it is. So I think all these can, things are of concern. As I say, there's enough work for all of us working away on the, the different dimensions of how you bring peace in society. Do I turn it on? Oh, yep. We're there. Um, so, Helen, we're a very small country but still mighty, and the world looks to us for a lot of things, especially leadership, and with, thanks to Ashley Bloomfield, our king, our COVID-19 <laughs> response has been pretty good, so I think people are looking at New Zealand with keen eyes. Um, in the peacekeeping space, um, how do you think the world sees us as leaders, um, as, yeah, leading the peace conversation? Well, in the eight years I had at the UN, actually the overall image of New Zealand was pretty good. And, and I think um, the way the Prime Minister led the country on the horror, horrors, multiple, of the mosque murders, uh, you know, New Zealand has had universally, you know, good feedback from that. that you know, the declaration that we are one, this is an attack on, on our country, uh, you know, that can only enhance New Zealand's reputation. But I think, I think we need to do more. <laughs> I, I think uh, we, we haven't actually been the greatest contributors uh, to um, UN peacekeeping for, for a long time. I mean, we, we've kept up other efforts, uh, you know, whether it's been regional efforts in the Solomons or Bougainville, where we played quite an important role in Don McKinnon's time as, as, as Foreign Minister. 
Um, of course, the long-standing uh, multinational force in the Sinai made a significant contribution too, but un undoubtedly we, we could do more uh, in the peacekeeping sphere. Um, I think also, you know, New Zealand foreign policy, unless carefully watched, does have a tendency to lapse back into primarily being about trade. And actually, foreign policy is often about values, and you do have to express values. And, uh, you know, I think people like to, to see their country take a stand on values. We need to hear more again on the, on the nuclear disarmament uh, issues. Uh, I think also the, there's more that could be said on, on a range of the, the shocking things that happen uh, around the world uh, through the statements that we make. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. For weeks now, uh, there have been huge protests in Belarus against yet another rigged election. You know, people have had enough. Um, well, our response was a tweet from the foreign minister. A tweet from the foreign minister. I mean, it's not good enough. So, you know, th there are significant uh, issues, and, and I, I think we want to hear our country's voice on them. That would be my feeling. Just feeding off of that, um, what do you think are the biggest barriers from us participating in the capacity that you would wish New Zealand to? Well, you have to invest in diplomacy. And if you compare the investment we make with, say, a country of like size, like Norway, there's no comparison. I mean, Norway over decades has invested, invested, invested in its, in its mediation, peace-building uh, capacity. And they don't blow their trumpet about it. They're often behind the scenes working to bring disparate actors together to solve the most intractable conflict. It's, it's not easy. But we're in a world where... You know, more than 70 million people now are displaced, forcibly displaced by conflict and oppression. Now, you know, there's what, 7.8 billion people in the world, you know, 70 million, is that close to 1% of us uh, are displaced forcibly. I mean, this is unconscionable. Uh, so we need more, you know, peace building uh, committed uh, countries. You know, some of these conflicts, of course, are, are fueled by outside actors, and that's the reason they become intractable, because regional powers and great powers dig in behind uh, different actors in, in various uh, civil wars and theatres. It's, it's, it's very disturbing, but I think, you know, New Zealand should think, and you know, hopefully under a different kind of government configuration after the 17th of October, uh, think about this whole, um, you know, strategy for New Zealand diplomacy and, and projection of the, you know, what what we seek as a country, which is a, you know, a more peaceful world. Thank you. So this year, 2020, has been challenging, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, this pandemic has impacted everyone around the world in ways that we could not have possibly imagined a year ago. And it's been a hard year for a lot of people. Um, people are feeling lonely and separated, and there's a lot more fear of being around others because we're afraid of this um, invisible enemy that, uh, that can hurt all of us. And with that all being said, what I'm wondering is, what are some of the things that the pandemic has helped us to see in our society that we may not have seen before? What is what has COVID-19 revealed about our society that is miss, that was missing? Well, it, it's revealed quite a lot of things. It's revealed, for example, that when we need to find places off the streets for the homeless, we can. Right? <laughs> and and it's, it's just a pity that it took a pandemic to do it. Thank God it was done, and I hope they're not being pushed back out of the motels now, uh, because we can, as a society, overcome homelessness. It needs uh, commitment and it needs, uh, it needs resourcing. Uh, you know, one of the things I found um, quite shocking in a way was how close to the line so many 
households and small businesses and even what we think of as medium-sized and quite large businesses are. And you take away seven weeks of business and it's like the whole deck of cards goes down. I mean, that's living pretty close to the line. Uh, and I, I'm the patron of one of the big food banks in the South Auckland uh, area. Um, the manager of it <laughs> rang me one day. He said, we're, we're overwhelmed. Can you help with an appeal for funds? I said, well, sure. I said, what's the comparison? He said, well, I've had 364 uh, uh, sets of requests in today uh, for food parcels. And I said, well, what would you normally get at a weekend? He said, about 34. So that's how it, it just blew out. Now, there were, there were sort of couple of patterns here. One was, of course, while the government came forward with job subsidies, thank goodness, or the economic and social carnage would have been greater, the reality is I don't think it covered the whole salary. It was an 80%. And that's the margin, isn't it? That's the margin. So people who missed the 20%, they were in for the food parcel because by the time they pay the rent and, and, and all the other expenses or the mortgage or whatever, there was nothing left. But there was another big group that we overlooked, and I think this is um, of great concern, and that was the migrant workers who didn't qualify. Uh, they qualified for charity, but I think there was, was often a requirement that they had to spend their resources before they got help. And of course, you come here to earn money. A lot of the reason for coming here is to send remittances home. So if you have to spend all the money you'd save for the remittances for your child's education in Vanuatu or you know, your mother to have an operation in Fiji, um, it, it, it's pretty tough. And I was telling some friends a story um, earlier about um, uh, one of the many in, in the queue for help at this food bank, uh, uh, a young man who asked if he could have a uh, uh, packages of nappies with the food parcels. So the manager was a bit concerned and he went to ask him, uh, do you have children? Are there ways that we can help? The man said, no, no, I don't have children, they're for me. And he said, well, are, are you ill? Can, can we help? He said, no. He said, I have nowhere to live, so I have to sleep in the car and it's dangerous at night, so I need the nappies. So, you know, we have left people very vulnerable and I think, you know, we need to reflect on the on the, 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 the role and, and, and place and support for migrant workers. You know, on, on a bigger scale in Singapore, their early approach to COVID-19 was greatly praised as successful. The problem was they forgot they had a million migrant workers living in poor conditions and the pandemic got away there. So, you know, these inequalities that we create in society are really laid uh, laid by, uh, bare by this. I mean, also, you know, referring to the issues of loneliness, there was a survey done, I think, in 2018, maybe it was even the rather botched census we had, I can't remember, but it, it revealed that about 3.5% of uh, New Zealanders said that they felt lonely all or most of the time. A survey that was done uh, during that period of, of severe lockdown it soared to about 10.5%. And I have a little foundation, Helen Clark Foundation, and Holly Walker, who was once a Green MP who, who works for us, she directed her attention during the lockdown and aftermath to this issue of loneliness and, and what its characteristics were in New Zealand. And what she found and what the research points to is a very strong correlation with income. Because if you don't have adequate income, you can't adequately participate and connect. You know, I mean, I have a sister who has three grandchildren in the United Kingdom. Fine. She's got Wi-Fi on a smartphone. The kids in the UK have got Wi-Fi on a smartphone. So they can chatter away to each other. But if you can't afford the Wi-Fi, how do you connect uh, with your whanau in, in the suburb next door? when you can't go out of a bubble. So low income has a huge impact on whether you feel loneliness in these circumstances. Interestingly, the loneliness uh, didn't appear to soar so much among uh, older people who perhaps, you know, many are used to living alone and, and working the phones and, and so on, but younger people felt it because they're used to being social and, and together. And an issue that is neglected worldwide uh, issues of, of, of mental health and support services for adolescents and youth. This is a gap 
everywhere. Uh, one of my hats at the moment is I chair the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which is a sort of thousand plus member partnership headquartered in WHO. And we have a youth and adolescent constituency and we are working up to helping sponsor a major uh, youth and adolescent health and wellbeing summit so that that demographic can get their issues out and talk about the kinds of needs that they have, psychosocial uh, support, sexual and reproductive health services, you know, the whole range of things that you know, young people have on their minds. Um, you mentioned the Helen Clark Foundation, so I wanted to talk about that for a little bit. Um, so the Helen Clark Foundation advocates for engaged communities. Um, so how can we help to create an engaged community and what might religious faith communities, what role might they play in that picture? Well, look, look what you're doing, bringing people together. I mean, it's incredibly important. We have to create spaces for people to meet, uh, to be together, to have their associations. I mean, we must never underestimate the importance of the role of local government. Local government are providing the community facilities, the meeting spaces, where, where community groups of whatever kind can come together you know, for, and, and not have to pay extortionate fees for hiring rooms, but it's a space they can call their own where they can meet you know, to advance their shared interests, to talk. Uh, to, to socialise. So I think you know, local government's role is very important and the, the support you know, that, 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 that can be given in, in many ways to civil society. Civil society is core to engaged societies. In a sense, governments can't build engaged societies, but they can create a tone and a platform uh, and the support on which civil society can thrive. I think that's important. Um, panelists, would anyone else like to address this concept of um, engaged communities and how might the religious faith communities fit into that picture? I think that language of um, advocating for engaged communities um, implicitly highlights an issue in society which Helen has talked about in terms of that loneliness, that mm. deep loneliness that many feel. We have become in many ways disengaged communities, atomized, disengaged from one another and disengaged from civic participation, from our commitment to the common good, our communal life together. And I think this is um, a way that faith communities can play a really significant role in terms of um, providing communal narratives for individuals to find a sense of, of purpose, of belonging, um, a shared history of where we've come from together and a shared vision of hope of where we can go. And, and when people are feeling isolated and alone, to be held by others in that sense of isolation. Um, one of the, the, the shortcomings, I think, of our society is that we have placed the individual at the center of society and almost glorified the individual. Um, we've lost any kind of sense of um, meta-narrative, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing with the breakdown of Christendom. But if you don't have communal narratives in which the individual can find belonging and purpose and meaning, then the individual's going to flounder and feel isolated and alone. Mm. Mm. Amal or Emily, is there if anything to add? Um, I just wanted to say, if... It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or not. If you walk into a mosque, if you walk into the house of God, you will immediately find community. You will find acceptance. You will find belonging. And that right belongs to everyone. And I think that's the beautiful thing about religion. It really is about community. It's everyone kind of chipping into this shared collective story that we all own together. And before, Helen, you were saying that um, our policies should... Re reflect our values and at the moment I'm going to be a little bit controversial here at the moment I don't think it holds those values of inclusion of um, of belonging like our Muslim brothers and sisters we face discrimination all the time um, the fact that we even have to talk about whether refugees should come into this country mm. blows my mind you don't find those things in policy you find it in community and you find that with religion So one of the reasons that I love the opportunity to come together right now is that hearing Jordan and Amal speak, 
about this is exactly the same as what I think about for our Jewish communities. Um, we want it to be a place that welcomes anyone. We want it to be a place that people can find, I, I loved how you said this, Jordan, um, they, they can find their own narrative within the larger narrative of the tradition. Um, we have a saying that no one can be Jewish alone. We need community. Um, all of our, our, our rituals for, for mourning and healing and, and, and being together require a, a cadre of people, or we say a minion of people for prayer, which is 10 people. Um, we, we need each other, we really do. And I, I truly believe that because of the pandemic and because of this isolation and loneliness that so many of us are feeling at home, if, if we're zooming into all, everything that we're doing, we, we need our communi communities more than we ever did before. We have to get together. We have to support each other because we, the only way we can move forward is together. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to piggyback off of what you th what everyone has said and to go back you mentioned briefly about social media and bullying and the ability now to tweet our condolences to another country um you know and 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 to be able to hide behind that oh tick that box we we addressed this issue um on the other hand, I think many of us have seen the ability for social media to bring people together especially during a year of isolation um, so I wonder if we can uh, pause and ha talk about that, talk about both the dangers and the blessings of social media and how we might balance that or be wary of that. You know, as I see it, a medium like Facebook, it, it started with good intentions to connect people, you know, to connect families and then eventually friends and other networks. The problem is that not everyone is seeking connection for benign purposes. And that played out in the horror that was Christchurch, where that man was able to you know, hide behind uh, the anonymity of these platforms, find these you know, very bleak, distant corners of the internet to communicate with others, uh, in effect, tweet his intentions, uh, uh, live broadcaster killing and, and social media uh, didn't stop it um, because their, their commercial incentives are to get people using it and the more outrageous the more clicks you know so they certainly have some some answering to do and should be held accountable uh, one of the early papers my foundation did was called anti-social media like anti-social and it, it, it looked at, at, at what you might do, to, because social media is an unregulated space. Now we find ways of regulating our broadcast and our print media, but this has been free fire zone, literally, tragically. Uh, so uh, what our paper suggested was, uh, if you like, a, a bespoke regulation, uh, where you would place a statutory duty on the uh, companies to have a, a proper uh, duty of care uh, framework and, and code of conduct, but you would have a regulator over that who would uh, assess the adequacy of what they came up with and hold them to it so that when people make complaints, you know, it's got to be properly measured. I mean, I, I'm a regular reporter of um, uh, racist, uh, you know, anti-Semitic, uh, hate speech, uh, etc. tweeters, because I don't think they should be on these platforms. You know, you get a bit of success, but often you don't. And uh, I think these platforms should be held more accountable by independent regulators. Any members of the panel want to mention, want to discuss? I completely agree. We need more regulation on social media. Um, it's it's become an avenue for so much hate speech and so much like inciting violence. Um, and but be even even more nuanced than the the uh, the very obvious cases of racism and anti-Semitism and bigotry and misogyny and all all of that. Um, there's there's a lack of civil discord. And there's a lack of civil debate. I, I try to stay off of social media for the most part because it 
Well, for all sorts of reasons, but um, I, I went on this morning and I was thinking about, we would be talking about social media tonight, and um, I saw a sermon from a rabbi that I learned from, uh, his name is Rabbi Brian Stoller, and he was talking about how disagreeing respectfully is is what it's all about. It, it's actually a, a tenet of Judaism to debate things and discuss and and disagree respectfully. It's it's a virtue. But shaming or hating others or insulting their person for their for whatever it is that they said, that is never virtuous. That is never acceptable. And um, this even there, this goes back very deeply in, in Judaism. We have a, a teacher called Maimonides, um, who is one of the sages of the Talmud, and he said that this line between opposition and hatred is a very fine line, but it's of critical importance. Um, when you see someone acting wrongly or leading others down an evil path, he says protest it, speak up, silence is complicity, but do not insult them because that is also a transgression. Yeah, social media is a very interesting and tricky one and something that I've been thinking a lot about ever since the Christchurch attack, to be honest. Just the way that social media is used now is really interesting. It definitely can be used for good. Like, for example, with the Black Lives Matter movement recently, I think it has been very, very helpful for a lot of people to um, get a lot of information really quickly. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had a platform in like the mainstream media, but it did have a platform on social media. And this is more of a personal thing, but back in the day, we would use phone cards to call people back home in Africa, and because Africa's so far away, it would literally be like $5 for 30 seconds. Um, but now we can connect to the motherland so easily, um, and it's really, really nice. But it definitely can be used um, for evil and for bad, depending on who is using it. And with social media, if you strip it back, literally it's just another mode of communication. But somehow it's become this all-consuming thing and we've kind of lost our humanity along the way. I mean, people's self-worth is built and destroyed on social media. Um, people pick up stories, often ignorant and incorrect about different communities um, on social media and do not question at all and that's another scary thing about social media as well there are so many voices on there and they are all so loud no one's regulating each other um, and because everyone it seems like everyone is on social media it seems like whatever happens on social media it has the tick from society so when there are negative stories out there about our tangata whenua and our um, PI brothers and sisters, then you know it has that green tick, and everyone else kind of jumps on this board and like, well, yeah, they're this and they're that, and that's so not true. But because we have completely lost our humanity, we are not connecting with humans. We are not connecting with stories. We are just connecting with these faceless, nameless um, voices on social media, which is so dangerous if you're not aware of how you're consuming social media and we don't have that awareness as a collective we don't have the awareness so we're just consuming 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 all the time which is really 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 dangerous um, and so I hope that as we gain that awareness we can reshape how we use social media and what power it has um, hopefully for good um, in our society and our community before we switch gears here I want us all to take a deep breath, and if there is a final statement, a final word of peace or hope um, that each of you can offer before we turn it over to the audience, take a moment and think, whoever's ready to speak first, but what is a final message of hope that you can leave us with tonight? Well, it's the old story, without hope the people perish, right? You, you have to have hope, and I think, um, the faith communities have a very important role in building that 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 hope that things can be better if 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 we if we work at it, uh, one way or another. I think you also find hope uh, in inspirational stories of of uh, 
of those who've triumphed over, over huge adversity, and I, I was thinking, you know, anticipating this question tonight, of someone like Malala in Pakistan, uh, who uh, the Taliban tried to assassinate, and they did her damage, and she was fortunately able to go to the United Kingdom and get good surgery and recover uh, her health, uh, and go on to be a star student at Oxford and found a, a, an NGO and become a voice for, for peace and tolerance and, and respect and, and dialogue and uh, advocating for education for girls. And you think, you know, if, if, a, if a teenage girl from Pakistan can pick herself up from that, well, each of us can get up in the morning and say, you know, we could do something uh, here. So I find those, those sort of stories really inspirational. I thought of another one too, which some of you may have seen on uh, the BBC coverage of the reporter who went back to find uh, the Syrian uh, young woman refugee who made her way from Syria through Turkey on a boat to Greece and up through the Balkans to Germany in a wheelchair. It was unbelievable. And there she is in Germany now. She's uh, continuing her education. She has aspirations. But the courage of that young woman, I was blown away by her. You know, fortunately, there are many, many such inspirational stories, and, and we should take heart from them. For me, hope uh, begins in listening. Um, as a Christian, listening to God in prayer, but importantly, also listening to one another. Um, I don't have anything else to say. Mm. What I'm thinking about is when so many of these big, big problems seem insurmountable, remember that if we start small, if we take one little step, the next step is easier, and then the next, and the next, and we keep walking. This is something my partner reminds me all the time, even when I just, like, I, I don't want to cook something because that seems too hard. But, but if you just start it, then it gets easier. And reach out, and people reach back for you. Um, I suppose for me, hope is being radically kind. Um, and being radically kind to yourself first. So having a lot of love and compassion towards yourself, asking yourself, who do I belong to? Where do I come from? Where does my strength come from? Where does my validation come from? Because if you can't answer those questions for yourself, then you cannot do those things to other people. Um, be radically kind to each other. Um, respect each other. Be able to accept that you won't always come to the same conclusion, but you can always leave with love. Um, so yeah, that's what radically, uh, being radically kind comes to me. And from an Islamic point of view, I find hope um, with the quote that with every hardship there will be ease. Um, from the Islamic point of view, whatever you go through, God won't put you through that um, if there isn't you know, a light on, on at the end of the tunnel. If there is, there will be a learning lesson throughout this journey, however painful or traumatic it is. Um, and this lesson you will carry with you for the rest of your life. And those lessons will be passed on to future generations as well. So yeah, with every hardship there is ease and be radically kind to yourself and others. Awesome. Thank you. Now before we open it up to all of you, I turn to, oh, uh, where is he? Matwa Ali Olsen. Uh, Ali Olson, if you want to come, you have a, um, a question for Helen, and you'll kind of transition us to open, um, but I will bring the microphone to you. Yeah, yeah kia ora, Helen. Kia ora. Um, it's really, really awesome to have you here. And it's a, it's a wonderful place to be, to have this conversation. The, um, I was cheeky enough to, to ring the university. Uh, <laughs> and actually asked if I could be part of this because I don't belong to an organization. Um, I belong to an old ancient Māori tradition that almost disappeared through the Tohunga Suppression Act of 1907 to 1962. And during that time, most of it had been lost. So I'm reviving it. My mother said, if you want to do anything in this life, son, work with the people who are full of hate. I thought she was crazy, naturally, 
same thing, you know everything. But what she meant was, and what she said to me was, hate is love, just trying to find its way out, and it doesn't know how to do that, so you need to work with them. So most of my life, I've, um, and I didn't mean to choose this, but I'm teacher trained, I had more teachers training college. There happened to be a prison close by. <laughs> so we were challenged with going to a non-tertiary institution to do some learning and to do some teaching. So I've been going into prisons since 1963. And um, I've been trying to work with, with people who are unfortunately in the category that, that Helen's spoken about where the environment isn't that good financially, the poverty is up here. And if the poverty's in here and in here, so can peace. And the old ancient uh, philosophy of Iwamatua Kore is the philosophy that I espouse. So I've been going around since 1964 to take and give this teaching to my people because it's been taken away. And I love it. But um, my wife and I take it at home because we don't want to put it into an institution where we lose control of it. Um, and we're happy to do that. Um, but all in all, when, I, when um, Greg Hewson rung me and says, you yeah, would like to have you on board, mate, but the panellist is already done. Uh, but we're going to give you the first right of reply. I felt absolutely over the moon. And I thought my ancestor, Rua Kenana, who became a Christian, the old teachings, and he married the two together. But he was arrested because he was discouraging Maori men to go to battle. And he named one of our, our marae, Muru Murunga, after he got out, after he was released. Muru Murunga means absolute forgiveness. And I thought, wow, isn't that beautiful? He'll be doing a dance now or we hucker up there somewhere. Uh, so I, I sit here as a pacifist, um, and I have a daughter who's in the military. <laughs> so we have a good debate. <laughs> but the thing is, I agree uh, with members of the panel, peace is an inside job, and you carry it wherever you go. It's not something that you just learn, it's something that you are. As my mother said, it's an experience. It is not an academic treatment. And I remember a, a laughing at a book that was written by Leo Biscaglia when he asked the vice chancellor of, of a university I won't name, I would like to take lectures on love. The vice chancellor said to him, love does not merit academic treatment. <laughs> so I've sent in a, a submission really, and the submission is uh, how can we get, just like uh, Bhutan, you know, the little state of Bhutan, 770,000, squashed in between, I think, China and India. The, um, when I read about this, I thought, whoa, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a proposal. And um, so here's my proposal. Excuse me, because I've scribbled them down on a piece of paper. And I think, Helen, you've got, you've got a, a first version. There's about 10 versions. Um, if, uh, can I read it out? I am Ngati Fari of Tuhoi. I am a recipient of the ancient Māori philosophy, which was a ca uh, casualty of the Tōhunga Suppression Act of 1907. The act was revoked in 1962, and when I heard that the healing power of peace and love brought the different faiths together here in Dunedin to form the AIG in response to the 9-11 attack, I decided to add my voice to theirs as a kaumātua and Tohunga Māori haora. My submission is, hey, why don't we expand on the DAIG model and construct a national philosophy along the lines of the one in Bhutan, where its well-being index is measured through GNH, gross national happiness. And this next part is the part that excites me. The Bhutanese government policy guidelines are based on the philosophy of happiness. Imagine Judith Collins and our Prime Minister <laughs> in Parliament and our MPs, our, our MPs standing up, John Clark saying, hey, I can't feel the love, man. <laughs> Likewise, our government policy guidelines can be based on a philosophy of GNLP, gross national love and peace. 
This is my fantasy. Our university is uniquely blessed with the National Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies, thanks to the founding director, um, Professor Kevin Clements, now retired. I love it. We have the expertise, we have the professionalism, the skills, and I believe the commitment to put an official national philosophy together to put to the government. And I believe, and here's, here's where my question bit comes, I believe that there is a parliamentary process. It's called the Living Standards Framework. For the introduction of a love and peace philosophy to provide guidelines for government policy. And uh, of course, my simple question to you, Helen, is um, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora, Ollie. Uh, I've actually have engaged with Bhutan on the Gross National Happiness Index because uh, when I was at the United Nations Development Program, Bhutan was uh, one of our clients, if you like, as a developing country. And uh, we, we invited Bhutanese uh, ministers to brief us. There was a major conference sponsored at the UN by Bhutan on the Gross National Happiness uh, Index, and I've, I've run into the former PM of Bhutan on many occasions, and we still talk about it. Uh, Dubai also has a, a, a Minister of Happiness, or UAE. Uh, but what was interesting about Bhutan was it wasn't just an abstract con concept. They had goals, targets, indicators, and ways of measuring them. They were they were serious about the uh, the gross national happiness. And I, I recall the the conference they sponsored at the UN, where Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who's well known personality, spoke. I spoke. Others spoke. But the most profound speech that was made that day was by a Frenchman who had lived in the Himalayas in a Buddhist monastery for many years. And when he got up to speak, he said to this large international audience. He said, you know, if a nation is the most powerful and the wealthiest in the world, but its people are unhappy, what is the point? Well, what is the point? So I think that does tell us that, <laughs> that happiness is important. What makes for happiness? How could we make our societies, uh, you know, enjoy more happiness and be serious about it. I don't think the Living Standards Framework is a substitute for that. Uh, I, I am an advocate of you know, governments adopting the su Sustainable Development Goals as a, as a framework, but I think there is something to be said uh, for the way that Bhutan has approached it. Thank you, Ali, for your question and for honoring us with a bit of your story and for starting us off. So now we open to all of you. I know we don't have as much time as we would like for this, but if there are a couple questions, we would love to hear them. Another one. But I got a young nephew here who's faster than I am. <laughs> if you do have a question, yep, stand up, put your hand up, yep, so we can see you from afar. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruth Groffman. I'm president of the Dunedin Interfaith Council, which actually was an offshoot of the day, um, Dunedin Abrahamic Group. We formed because even though the, council, the Abrahamic Group is only three faiths, we wanted to open up to all faiths. And this basically follows your revelations about loneliness, and things like that, but mostly so that we can come together and learn each other's faiths and have the understanding that we are really all one. So my question is, do you feel that we actually need more of this? More interaction with more faiths? Oh, absolutely. And as I said, you know, our country has become very, very diverse 
But how much do we know about each other? Actually, not a lot. Sometimes just the superficial things. Old Chinese, they have a, a new year and a lion. You know, Diwali, they light candles. Our understanding is, is very superficial. So I think anything that, that you can do to, to broaden understanding of perspectives, how values come to be the, the way they are, what priorities people have, you know, this is important. So be encouraged. Thank you. Hi, Helen Clark. Um, I just want to acknowledge you, how great you are, because as a young girl, I've seen you on TV, and I'm just such amazed and honoured to actually meet you now. Uh, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Deepa and I'm from India and uh, it's a great opportunity and a privilege to be here and I'm telling this why because back home I've, I have eight of my family members who are COVID positive and they're recovering so it's stressful and I can't do much from here. All I can do is call them and be hopeful and this conversation today has really been helpful. However, I, um, as realistic I may sound, I just want to ask the panel members, um, this generation and the future generation, are we standing on a crossroad that is between good and evil? Or is my choice between lesser evil or greater evil? I'm always um, confused. Yeah, no, no, let, let's not say it's between, you know, lesser or greater evil. <laughs> that, that would be horrible. I mean, I think we are at a turning point. We, we face globally what you might call a, a syndemic of issues, right? They're all coming at us at the same time. We have this extraordinary level of conflict and displacement. Uh, we have these huge ecosystem challenges with climate, uh, with, with biodiversity. Uh, we have um, intractable uh, issues and not enough progress on poverty eradication, hunger eradication, every child in school, uh, you know, stopping preventable mortality in, 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 in childbirth, in, in pregnancy, in the, the first five years of life. I mean, and, and all of this, by the way, has been set back by the pandemic. The consequences of the pandemic are, are not the tragedy of the, the million dead, and, and the 15% or so who have the serious legacy effects on their, on their vital organs. It, it's all the spillover consequences of, of the money uh, that, that isn't now there to invest in, in, in services that people need. The fact that there are children and there, there could be as many as 30 million of them who will never return to school after the lockdowns. You know, pov extreme poverty will, will increase. Uh, you know, hunger will, in extreme hunger as at brink of starvation will just about double. So we, we can't accept that, 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 that this is the right way to go. We, we have to say that there is a better way uh, for, for human beings to live uh, in greater harmony with the natural environments and in, in more inclusive ways that don't exclude the way we exclude. We exclude enormous numbers of people. You know, you have uh, pre-pandemic 831 million people in the world uh, who go to bed hungry at night. As I say, out of the 7.8 billion of us, that's just quite a significant proportion. So we, we can't accept that. We, we have to say there's things we can do. Uh, but it, it is a turning point and a lot of things are coming at us simultaneously. And we, it, it, it is time for a reset. And, and I think it'll be tremendously disappointing if countries don't take the opportunity for a reset, if the world doesn't take the opportunity for a reset. You know, maybe the American election will bring the possibility of a reset. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you know, that matters to, to, to all of us. Uh, 
Um, but let's not accept that it's, it's going to be bad, but not quite so bad. We have to aim for something better. Um, okay. This idea of a reset just came up on our Jewish calendar last week, or not even last week, a few days ago with Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement. And we say that the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, um, it, the day itself atones for transgressions against God. But for any transgressions from one human being to another, the Day of Atonement does not atone until we've made peace with one another. So. I, I really think that every action that we, that we do, everything we do in our lives is a choice. We always have a choice to go the right way or go the wrong way. Um, but most importantly, even though we're all human and sometimes we go the wrong way, we have to correct it. We have to seek forgiveness, we have to make apologies, and we have to try to do better, to go the right way. I think I'd just quickly add that I, I, I really um, would steer away from the language of greater evil and lesser evil. Um, and as well about thinking about can we choose a good versus evil option in any given situation. The problem with that is we'll always be left wondering could we have chosen a better option that would have produced more good in the world. And we end up with this intolerable yoke of legalism. Actually, I would rather pick up that language of shalom that Emily talked about before, about right and flourishing relationship. Human life is life freed for love, freed for flourishing relationship. And our duty as human beings is to seek to disrupt, to reset, as Helen said, that cycle of violence, that cycle of moralism that dominates our world. Kia ora tata. Um, I'm interested in uh, knowing the response you have to, to Fenelon, the, the fabric of this Mother Earth that we're all so dependent on. I've heard a couple references, but I do not see any deep reflection on how it has bearing on our sense of peace. Because the way we treat animals, the way we treat this Earth, is near, near to appalling. And I'd like to have some sense of how this panel respond. Thank you. Yeah, well, as human beings are a pretty invasive species, aren't we, uh, with, uh, with ecosystems, and we've done tremendous damage because traditionally the way humankind has, has developed has been without thought to what the carrying capacity of our natural ecosystems uh, is. Uh, so we exhaust the climate, you know, we exhaust all kinds of things. Haven't we just about exhausted fresh water here? You know, it, 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 it's not good. So the reset needs to come back to, to saying, what do we need to restore uh, the, the planet's health? And we do need to do things uh, differently. Uh, you know, I, I certainly hope that in New Zealand we can see a move to totally sustainable energy because if we keep you know, firing up the Huntley Power Station, we're part of the problem. Right? So we just need to, to look at what, what are the things that we can do to, to, to reconnect uh, with uh, you know, not, not doing more damage to ecosystems and hopefully beginning to, to restore. Huge damage has been done. Um, over the years, I think, when uh, particularly the Christian West has taken a particular verse in the Hebrew Scriptures where God called the human beings to look after and steward the earth as to look after and dominate, to have dominion over. And particularly when that word became combined with capitalism and the development of industrialization in the West, we have caused untold harm and destruction to our earth. And in that respect, we have so much to learn, and in many other respects, from uh, the tangata whenua, and from, for example, the concept of kaitiakitanga, of stewardship of our land. Let's recover this language of stewardship, of looking after, caring for, bringing to fulfillment. That, to me, is language that's much truer to the Hebrew, the scriptural understanding of our human role on the planet.
I'll just quickly speak to that because I'm aware that there are lots of other questions in this room. Um, but the thing with family is that it's very n noisy, messy, um, and in my house I can definitely tell you that there's not always peace when there's 10 people in one roof. Um, but with family, there's always respect for each other. Um, and when you have respect for each other, you treat each other with kindness, with um, love. Um, and I think we need to extend what our definition of family is. You're not going to meet every single person on this earth. You're not going to visit every single country um, in this earth as well, but that's still family. Um, and the smiley way of thinking about family is that family is so important. You don't operate from I. You operate from that aspect of we. What is what is better for us, what is better for our family. And I think we have forgotten that family includes our brothers and sisters in humanity, but it also includes Mother Earth as well. And this definition of family, it's very um, prominent in like Somali culture, but also indigenous cultures. Um, you know, they have looked after the land for such a long time and within I don't know, this short amount of history, 300 years, I think, we have pretty much destroyed Earth. Um, and so I think we need to redefine what family is and think about it from that aspect of we and us um, and treat it with respect. We have another question here. Yana koutou katoa, kohepa aho. I'm a student here at the university. Um, my faith is really important to me. Um, I'm very conscious that a lot of my friends and a lot of my, sorry, a lot of my secular friends and acquaintances and maybe a lot of people here would argue that there would be more peace worldwide and perhaps more peace uh, within in New Zealand uh, or even more peace within Dunedin or within our street or within our family. Uh, if we didn't belong to different religions or spiritual beliefs. Um, yeah, I feel there's a, a wide conscious, consciousness that um, each faith believes they are the right faith. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about your position and your faith's position uh, on peace. Thank you for that question. I will let you all answer and let everyone know that I think we'll have one more question after this and then we will wrap up. So who would like to respond first? <laughs> no one wants to go first. <laughs> um, so in Islam, there's a quote in the Quran that says, and I cannot quote this um, word for word, sorry, bad Muslim here, um, but something along the lines of, um, you were cut from different cloths so you can get to know each other. And I don't know why there's that assumption that differences are a bad thing. We need to normalize that differences are actually a beautiful thing. It's just another way of getting to know each other. And often those differences aren't really that different at all once you kind of get to know someone and understand their point of view. Um, I think of it as we're just looking at the same sun, but the rays are coming through different holes in the roof. So it seems different, but it really is coming from the same source. And can you imagine how boring life would be if we were all the same? Like, I think we need that diversity for a more engaged um, and radically kind community. There's a vision right at the end of uh, the Christian scriptures in the book of Revelation, which I mentioned earlier, picks up on the prophecy of Ezekiel, this vision of a restored creation. One of the key differences between the prophecy in Ezekiel and the prophecy in Revelation is that in Ezekiel, the temple stands at the center of the new Jerusalem. In Revelation, the temple is gone. And I think, I think for me, as a Christian, that is at the heart of my hope for a new creation is actually one where there will be no religion because God is intimately present with all life and we are living in a new creation with one another. And so religion kind of lives in that tension pointing to a day when we will not need to have our own distinct religions, when we will all be together in harmony. And yet, at the moment, realizing that we do not yet have the truth, no one has the truth, but we are all on this shared journey of truth together in this common pursuit of peace and love. Um, and I hope you've heard today that 
Islam, Judaism, Christianity, other religions are deeply committed to this um, this pursuit of peace. And so I don't see how without religion uh, we'll end up with any more peace. Mm. I love what both of you said here. Um, I really, I think that the the idea that we all have to be the same in order to coexist is is nonsense to me. Um, I really believe that we should celebrate our differences and that harmony comes from our embracing each other. You know, we all come from different places, different stories, different heritages, and that's okay and that's a beautiful thing. And part of sharing that heritage and and teaching one another is what helps us see the other person as human, is what helps us understand that we all do have the same heart, we all do have the same flesh and blood bodies, um, and it's okay to have different uh, faith backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and traditions that, that Teach, that we're proud of because it's where we come from. But it's, it's when you say that mine is the only right way that I don't trust you anymore. <laughs> Did we have one last? Yep. Yes, no. I hear voices, but I, oh, yes. Hello, hello. <laughs> oh, it's f always far louder than you anticipate. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, thank you all for your for your cordial. My question is for is for Helen. And now that I say that out loud, it feels um, overly casual and very gendered uh, to address someone of your stature so informally. So uh, apologies. I should have taken the time to think of something better. Um, but I've, I've been thinking about the comments that have been made earlier around peace here in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in a, in a post-colonial context. And, and you mentioned the Waitangi Tribunal as, uh, as a, a vehicle for reconciliation, and it, it is certainly part of the vehicle for reconciliation. Of course, that responsibility sits with the Crown more broadly. And I just wondered, in the moments that we have left, uh, whether through that lens of reconciliation, of peace, or of hope, uh, you, you had any comments to make um, all these years later about some of the more significant moments of your uh, prime ministership through the, the, the foreshore and seabed um, uh, legislation or uh, the, the Uruwera raids um, that occupied so much of the public discourse at that time. Uh, and, and very clearly are, uh, are situated within our wider discussion around what peace and hope might look like uh, here in a, in, in a, in a bicultural, post-colonial setting. Well, I think, you know, with the Uruwera raids, as I regularly respond to tweeters on this matter, uh, this was a police decision. It was not a government decision. And we live in a country where our politicians do not direct the police. They make their own decisions. I don't really have any particular comment to, uh, to make on it, except to say uh, that the police were aware of people you know, playing out various scenarios and you're aware as, in retrospect, clearly even for them, because they've often an apology, they felt you know, they, they went over the top. But one does just have in the back of one's mind what if it had been for real? You know, were the police entirely wrong? I think they are wrong in how they went about it. They'd be better to go and start talking to people rather than mounting raids on families and upsetting women and, and, and children and innocent people. Uh, so, you know, big lesson learned for them. Big lesson learned and apologies offered. Uh, so that, that's part of the, the journey as well. But as, as a government, uh, could we have stopped them doing it? No, we couldn't. And I think we do have to keep that line uh, where the police have a statutory role, the, the politicians must not direct uh, action. Uh, so that, that's that one. On, on foreshore and seabed, of course you reflect on it. And, and eventually, uh, what the next government did, as I recall, was declare that it belonged to no one. I wish some genius had suggested that at the time, but no, no genius did. You know, it, it did offer a way forward at the time. Uh, so, you know, my attitude always is that 
you do the best you can with the information you have in the circumstances you find yourself. And the outcome may not be perfect, uh, but you know you, you learn from that. Uh, so that, that's my reflection on it. Thank you all for your questions. Our hope tonight is that this is just either the beginning or the middle of these important conversations and that they will continue way beyond tonight. But I do want to stop and say thank you to Helen and the panelists for your candidness, for your time and your care tonight. Thank you. We now have Paul and Greg who are going to come forward for a few uh, final words for us. Push up. On behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you, Helen, for coming all this way. Uh, we started planning for this about a year ago, so it's wonderful that so many have come. And this has been our 17th annual gathering of this nature. All of the former peace lectures are on our website, which is dunedininterfaith.net.nz. The first one was delivered by David Longy in 2004, and I have a photo which I treasure of David Longy and I walking in through that door when I looked a lot younger. <laughs> but I'd like to thank Ollie for mentioning um, our friend who is dancing in, in heaven, who, um, Rua, Rua Kenana. I think also David Longy would be very pleased tonight um, that we've had Helen here. And to have someone, Helen, Helen, with your expertise and your experience to share with us has been wonderful. So. Well, um, our chairperson of the Abrahamic group says a few words, I'll present you with a gift on behalf of us all. Um, it's a Tui peace dove and also an Otago t-shirt for you to wear. It says a lot. It says a lot that we allow an Auckland person to become an Otago University uh, honorary member of our. our also, our gifts for the rest of them, so you can keep. Okay. Going. <laughs> this is for this our MC, who's doing a great job as the full-time ecumenical chaplain here at the university. Let's give her a round. Of I, th I think all of the, the most amazing things have been said this evening, and as Greg has um, quite rightly said, and so many others have said, this is the beginning of a conversation. University of Otago is very fortunate to be in a town and gown situation. We are, um, if I think 43 years ago, when I first stood in front of a lecture theatre, if we took a picture of 100, 95 of the students looked like me. There were three Chinese students from Malaysia. There was occasionally somebody on a Colombo plan, a Maori, a Polynesian, looking a little bit shy in the lecture theatre. Today we take a picture of 100, and as a Vice Chancellor and Chancellor and others know, we have the United Nations sitting here, and we have a half a dozen, dozen Maori Polynesians looking like, what was the problem? We always owned the place anyway. <laughs> so we are well, well placed. The University of Otago, <clears throat> with its 20 plus thousand students coming in and out and the public coming in and out, arguably amongst the most intelligent in the world, undeniably the most highly connected people in the world, as well placed to pick up the challenge that our Komato gave tonight. Nobody has been in a, a, a meeting like this without having seen me do a little Irish jig. The Vice Chancellor, just after the um, 
after uh, a meeting on, on, on uh, after the attacks in Christchurch when everybody got together, the vice chancellor called everybody together to see what we would do next. I believe that she turned to the secretary, Donna Jones, of the association and says, said, does he really do this? And I'm about to do it again. So what I'm going to do is ask the panel to stand up and then take a photograph of all of you so that we can give Greg a photograph of 17 years old. So if the panel would stand up, I will swap that for you. And a reminder that everyone is invited to supper at All Saints, but it is a bit later than planned, but we're still going to have the supper. And this is the photo. You want us, where do you want us? Photographs taken. Let us all say Kia ora. Kia ora. Hey, thank you, everyone.